Hello, uh, welcome to part two of pleomorphic and spindle cell soft tissue tumors in adults, uh, part of my uh, series of lectures on soft tissue uh, lesions and other uh, basic uh, issues in surgical pathology. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, the um, uh, the bad guys, as it were. So we're going to stop uh, where or pick up where we left off in part one and go on with some of the bad guys that uh, can uh, become problematic in uh, surgical pathology. So when we speak about these guys, of course, uh, uh, some are more pleomorphic, some are less pleomorphic, and of there are some lesions that we will not cover that will fit into other categories, such as the biphasic tumors that have one component that's a spindle cell, uh, but other components that may be more epithelioid and so forth. So uh, let's actually start with uh, a particular entity that um, is uh, of concern. But as we do that, I think it's important to keep in mind the backdrop uh, in, the, in, in terms of uh, some of the pitfalls that we can fall into with uh, these lesions. First of all, as we've already indicated in part one, there are many of these benign lesions that uh, can harbor a considerable degree of atypia. Uh, additionally, uh, there are many of these lesions that have an abundance of inflammatory cells and only rare neoplastic cells. So it can easily be mistaken for a reactive or uh, inflammatory process and uh, in fact, not be uh, um, uh, inflammatory, but in, be a true neoplasm. And then of course, there are uh, a variety of uh, mimics, non-sarcomatous malignancies that can look very sarcomatoid. Uh, melanoma is a classic example of a tumor that can uh, mimic so many different things, including uh, sarcoma. Uh, we know about the sarcomatoid carcinomas, and even at times lymphoma uh, can mimic a uh, sarcoma. Uh, and finally, there are a number of very low-grade sarcomas that look deceptively benign, just as there are benign lesions that look deceptively malignant. Uh, so all of these uh, present uh, uh, particular challenges, uh, and these are confounded by the fact that uh, these lesions are relatively uncommon in day-to-day -day surgical pathology practice. So what are we thinking about when we think about uh, lesions that have uh, abundant atypia uh, and can uh, masquerade, if you will, as the uh, sarcomatous lesion? So pleomorphic fibroma, uh, atypical fibrocystiocytoma, uh, and we've seen some of these uh, deep fibrocystiocytomas that have uh, a bit of atypia, and maybe even a little bit of altered matrix. Uh, atypical fibrosanthoma, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a moment. Pleomorphic lipoma uh, and some of the sim, uh, spindle cell lipomas can have a degree of atypia. Uh, and then uh, a classic, of course, is symplastic or uh, better termed bizarre leiomyoma of the uterus and the somewhat related uh, fumarate hydratase deficient uh, leiomyomas that can have really pronounced uh, nuclear pleomorphism and atypia. Uh, uh, an even more classic uh, example is the uh, so-called ancient schwannoma uh, with uh, marked nuclear degenerative atypia. Uh, and then we'll talk about pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor um, uh, as well as we go along. So uh, one of the ways to uh, sort of keep yourself out of the, the, the muck, if you will, in terms of pitfalls, uh, is to particularly uh, employ a panel approach in your immunohistochemical evaluation that will allow you to exclude carcinoma, melanoma, and uh, the, the main culprits in terms of uh, lymphoma that masquerade as uh, uh, potential sarcomas. So employing a variety of keratins, uh, melanocytic differentiation with uh, S100, HMV45, or melan A, potentially even SOX10, uh, and then uh, various uh, CD markers uh, that would be uh, relatively lineage specific. And finally, for the uh, anaplastic versions, uh, CD30 and ALK, uh, none of these markers uh, 
should be positive in a pure spindle cell or pleomorphic uh, lymphoma. Uh, and so finding a positivity should make us uh, pause and uh, take a, a second look at that uh, possibility. So first case up here, let's look at atypical fibrosanthoma. Obviously not a uh, malignancy, uh, but it uh, can look a lot like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Uh, but usually this is not gonna behave that way. This is a generally superficial uh, cutaneous uh, lesion that has a really pronounced degree of atypia, some proliferation, um, and uh, doesn't have the epithelioid uh, or uh, melanocytic markers, uh, but does express uh, P53, uh, CD10, um, and uh, may have a pattern of invasion. Uh, so uh, I've given you the QR code here again for some of the cases that we're going to look at. Uh, here's a nice example. Uh, you can see the cutaneous surface and a very cellular uh, tumor here uh, deep to that uh, with a uh, considerable degree of atypia, some pleomorphism, maybe some giant cells here in this process, sort of higgledy-piggledy arrangement of cells, uh, not always a good grunt zone between the tumor. Uh, and I think, you know, if we were to look around here, we'd even find some uh, mitotic figures uh, in these lesions, in this lesion. Uh, there may be variable areas of cellularity in this uh, process. Um, and obviously in a superficial biopsy like this, we can't distinguish the uh, invasive uh, base. Uh, but this uh, might in some respects look a lot like giant cell tumor of bone in some instances. Let's look at another example uh, here that uh, shows you again this uh, uh, cutaneous uh, lesion here, uh, superficial, and this one is more uh, myxoid and edematous and shows you more of this classic stellate uh, and spindle cell atypia that is uh, characteristic of this. But look at some of these nuclei, very uh, bizarre giant cells uh, and so forth, uh, and uh, a very pleomorphic uh, background. Uh, for this tumor. Um, this does have a slightly infiltrative pattern. And as you can see, it's been uh, completely excised um, down to the fascia, essentially. Um, but this would be a nice example of atypical fibrosanthoma um, in the uh, skin. And usually this is sun-exposed skin areas. That's why the face is such a common location. I think we've got one more example here, uh, again, illustrating the, the uh, spectrum of disease that can be seen. Again, we're in the cutaneous uh, location. Uh, this one a bit more spindly and fibrous. Uh, now, the, of course, the xanthoma component of the name here uh, comes from the uh, somewhat histiocytoid appearance to some of these cells with slightly foamy cytoplasm. Uh, and as you can see, there is variable degrees of atypia. This one, uh, much less atypical than the uh, previous one that we looked at, uh, more cellular. Uh, again, maybe a few mitotic figures here and there. Uh, and uh, you can see how this would uh, be a, a challenging differential uh, diagnosis. So uh, when we look at the main issue in terms of uh, differential diagnosis here with that lesion, we're talking <clears throat> about this undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Now, this is a, uh, a, a lesion that has a, a, a bit of history uh, and some old terminology is still present in the literature, which you may find on uh, review. Um, so there were a variety of uh, things that fell into this category of, quote, malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Um, and these had uh, various um, patterns, the storiform or pleomorphic, uh, the giant cell MFH, inflammatory MFH, had a lot of inflammatory cells, myxoid and angiomatoid. Um, but these terms with the, 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 uh, the acronym MFH uh, 
have uh, fallen out of favor and are best not used any longer. Uh, now we use the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma uh, with uh, some modifiers for these three lesions. Uh, but these two lesions have, have um, morphed into uh, uh, two categories with a new name and a more defined uh, clinical pathological uh, correlation. Uh, so uh, let's uh, think about these uh, lesions and just remember that sometimes uh, still this undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma uh, is uh, a, a diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to make sure that we have excluded things such as dedifferentiated liposarcoma or uh, other sorts of lesions, uh, giant cell tumor of soft tissue, um, mixo-inflammatory fibrosarcoma, and so forth, uh, to make sure that we're not um, putting uh, this term on a lesion that can have a more specific uh, categorization. Now, uh, we've mentioned the immunohistochemistry, uh, of course, ruling out uh, these lesions, uh, carcinomas, melanoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, pleomorphic leiomyosarcoma, pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, pleomor uh, <clears throat> liposarcoma, dedifferentiated liposarcoma, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor with rhabdoid features, um, and mixofibrosarcoma, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Uh, these are things uh, where uh, there is a relatively specific uh, immunoprofile, whereas uh, the uh, profile with undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma is going to be much less uh, specific. So cytokeratins, uh, epithelioid markers, S100 uh, melanocytic markers, we've mentioned these markers. For our muscle differentiation lesions, the combination of SMA and Desmoid, Desmon, uh, as well as the uh, HCal Desmon and Myogenin uh, can be useful in differentiating these uh, pleomorphic uh, leiomyosarcoma or rhabdomyosarcoma lesions uh, that might fit into these categories, as well as the uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor that can have uh, rhabdoid features and occasionally will have these uh, positive uh, muscle markers. So this is a, a useful chart, I think, in thinking about some of the other differential uh, considerations uh, in these uh, pleomorphic tumors as well. Now, we're not going to cover all of those entities uh, in this discussion, uh, but uh, we've mentioned that, that we don't use the term MFH uh, any longer uh, and that we want to include a panel of uh, immunohistochemistries that will help us to exclude carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, um, and uh, recognize that uh, these sarcomas have a, a rather broad spectrum of biological behaviors. Um, and that's why uh, finding the specific name and uh, being able to predict the behavior uh, based on that uh, name and, and phenotype is very, very important. Uh, again, I'll emphasize that undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, and only should be used when you've uh, been able to reliably exclude those other issues, those other entities that we've talked about. Um, and of course, the purpose of this is so that we have better data and more meaningful clinical trial uh, information. So here's our uh, examples uh, of undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Uh, here we see a lesion with uh, a variety of uh, very pleomorphic features. Uh, background with a little bit of uh, uh, inflammatory cells, some spindle and stellate cells, but uh, quite a wide array of uh, morphologic features. Uh, you know, extravasated red cells indicating poor vasculature um, and uh, varying degrees of necrosis, of course, can be seen, uh, which may be responsible for some of the inflammation and some of the edematous changes that you might see in a lesion like this. Uh, go quickly to another uh, example. Um, here, uh, one in the lung, uh, probably a metastasis. Again, note the pleomorphism, very uh, rounded cells in many of these large pleomorphic cells, but uh, some background uh, spindle and uh, pleomorphic cells, uh, atypical mitotic figures, very characteristic. Uh, 
of this lesion, um, no uh, specific rhabdoid features identified, uh, and variable storiform or spindle-shaped uh, cells associated with the pattern in this lesion. Uh, another example, uh, here a much more uh, uh, fibrous lesion, more pink uh, collagenous type of tissue, uh, a little bit of nodular growth. Uh, but again, we can see even at this magnification a degree of pleomorphism. Um, high uh, variability of the nuclei, uh, prominent nucleoli in many of these cells, uh, spindle and fibrous uh, background uh, to the proliferation. And uh, these lesions tend to have uh, a, a, a nodular, but also sometimes infiltrative pattern uh, so that it sometimes can be difficult to draw a, a reliable distinction as to where the margin is. Now this has some areas that are nicely defined, but other areas here where obviously it looked like they were around the lesion, but in fact, uh, they were uh, right up against the uh, 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 malignant or, or uh, infiltrative uh, tumor tissue. Another example, this one uh, more circumscribed and a bit of an older slide, I apologize for that. But you can see again, the features that we're looking at, storiform, spindle-shaped cells, a degree of pleomorphism, uh, and then of course the absence of uh, more specific markers. Uh, variable uh, hypo and hypercellular areas, ectatic vessels uh, at times uh, with uh, some uh, interstitial hemorrhage or necrosis associated with some of these uh, type of areas, as you can see here. Another uh, lesion, uh, nodular uh, growth pattern in this particular case, um, some associated inflammation, which you can see again here, much like the very first case we looked at. Uh, and this uh, amount of inflammation can be uh, quite variable uh, and at times can become kind of the uh, over, overwhelming uh, majority of the cells. Another example, and I think I'll just uh, allow you to look at this on your own. Uh, uh, because we'd like to move on to one of the lesions that's in the differential and which I mentioned can have a malignant type of behavior. Uh, this is the pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor, PHAT, uh, sometimes. Uh, this is a relatively rare lesion that occurs in adults. Um, it uh, tends to be uh, subcutaneous, uh, more common in the lower limbs. It's relatively slow growing. Um, and occurs with uh, equal frequency in men and women. Uh, now, this lesion can also have an inflammatory component, and you can see areas of hemosiderin. You can actually sort of see those to a degree here in this, uh, perhaps related to this angiectasia and prior hemorrhage. Uh, these lesions may be CD34 positive, so raising uh, consideration with uh, um, solitary fibrous tumor, perhaps. Um, and they're also negative for S100. Uh, there probably is some relationship with the uh, myxoinflammatory fibrosarcoma uh, and the hemosiderotic uh, fibrolipomatous tumor, uh, which also are relatively uncommon lesions, uh, but have some uh, morphologic simil similarities and may have uh, some uh, uh, similarity in the uh, molecular uh, realm as well. So I was able to uh, find uh, a few examples of this uh, lesion. Uh, here's one. Um, where you can really appreciate the uh, origin of the name. So uh, if these are not hyalinizing angiectatic regions, I don't know what you would describe as such. Uh, but this has this very prominent uh, hyalinized uh, ringing around some of these uh, vessels. Now, sometimes you don't see the vessel, uh, and that's because not all the areas around the vessels uh, will hyalinize uh, uniformly or at the same rate. Uh, but in between these areas is uh, somewhat uh, bland, low-grade appearing uh, 
uh, spindle cell proliferation uh, that uh, can have um, uh, varying degrees of uh, atypia. It was, I, had, I think I had another example here. Uh, here we can see the one that I took the photo from. Uh, and you can see that this uh, particular area has, uh, has the hyalinization and the angiectasia, uh, but it also has produced some degree of necrosis uh, associated with that. And you can see then the uh, uh, hemosiderin deposition that is sometimes seen in this lesion. Here's a more cellular area of this proliferation uh, with uh, the sort of uh, not quite epithelioid, uh, vaguely spindle-shaped uh, uh, lesion uh, with uh, a very mild degree of uh, pleomorphism. Uh, so this lesion uh, is uh, an uncommon lesion, but having seen a couple of examples maybe in examining these digital slides, you'll be a little bit better prepared for some of the spectrum that can be associated with this lesion. Uh, notice here that uh, we do have this sort of uh, uh, vague infiltration of surrounding fat, uh, giving uh, this sort of similarity to uh, other lesions that have that uh, pattern of growth uh, amidst fat. And here you see areas that have been uh, more completely overgrown by this spindle cell proliferation. So, uh, you know, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, uh, uh, other lesions that grow around fat in this uh, type of uh, process. Uh, should be in your differential. Uh, and obviously the uh, hyalinization and angiectasia can be relatively focal and not uniformly present throughout all of the tumor, uh, as is evident in this case, where uh, those changes are only fairly focal. So we'll move on to another lesion that also is uh, relatively uncommon, uh, and this is the mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma. And uh, this is a uh, tumor that has uh, somewhat of a distal extremity uh, predisposition, upper extremities more frequently. Again, it's uh, equal in male and females. Uh, there are a, a lot of inflammatory cells in this, a very mixoid background and these prominent uh, ganglion-like uh, malignant cells uh, that have prominent nucleoli and maybe some hemosiderin-related uh, cells. Uh, these uh, tumors have a TGFBR3 alteration uh, generally. Uh, so if you do a cytogenetics, uh, which we don't always do, or molecular studies on uh, one of these uh, pleomorphic uh, tumors, you might find that. Uh, here's the uh, sole example of this lesion that I was able to identify, which is the one we photographed here. Uh, and we'll come into higher magnification so you can see these uh, ganglion-like uh, cells. Uh, here's one here with a very prominent nucleolus. Um, and uh, to some degree, some of these other cells have this uh, pseudo-lipoblastic uh, type of appearance uh, in some of these areas. Not true lipoblasts. And you can see some of the inflammatory background here with uh, some uh, mast cells, maybe some eosinophils, uh, kind of rich capillary network. Uh, necrosis tends to be relatively uncommon in this lesion. We'll go on to the next uh, lesion, uh, which is the mixofibrosarcoma, uh, to be distinguished from um, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. The names are similar, but this is a high-grade tumor, as you can see here, a lot of pleomorphism to this tumor. Uh, this is usually a subcutaneous uh, tumor, uh, generally more extremities and trunk, uh, and again, equal um, occurrence in males and females. Um, if you see something that's in a deep location, intra-abdominal, retroperineal, or something like that, this is not what you should be thinking about. Those are extraordinarily rare in that location, uh, and much more common would be a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Uh, these are described as having uh, characteristic curved linear vessels, although that's not uh, uniformly uh, seen. Um, the uh, perivascular condensation of some of these spindle cells is, however, typical of mixofibrosarcoma. Uh, so this is a situation where you have a high-grade uh, pleomorphic sarcoma. Generally, you want to make sure you've well sampled that to make sure that you don't have just rare foci of uh, this mixoid change that would be typical of mixofibrosarcoma. Uh, 
uh, in general, at least 10% of the tumor should have that uh, myxoid uh, uh, feature to uh, be reliably classified. And I think I have an example here. Uh, yes, as you can see here, there's a solid, uh, fairly cellular tumor, but you can see here that uh, here we have the myxoid component. Here's the more cellular component. So uh, this is uh, greater than 10%, uh, and it's uh, staining very blue in this particular uh, example. Uh, but you can see it's quite a pleomorphic uh, tumor, uh, very dark stained here. I apologize uh, for that. Uh, with uh, pleomorphism uh, and uh, let's see if you can identify the curved linear vessels here. There are some of these delicate vessels uh, that tend to have a little bit of stromal condensation around them. So here you see they sort of stand out a little bit because of that uh, stromal condensation around them. Now, I'm not going to talk about the uh, myogenic uh, sarcomas. Oh, here's another example. I'm going to let you come back and study that on your own. Um, another example here, uh, again, showing uh, variable areas of myxoid tissue, <clears throat> a fairly delicate vascular background. It's somewhat subtle uh, in some of these areas, but sort of a branching, arc arching, uh, curvilinear uh, pattern to that. <clears throat> And as you can see here, not a huge degree of uh, pleomorphism in this lesion, uh, but there is some uh, that is present. Another example, much more myxoid uh, areas here, uh, as you can see at low power. And a deep subcutaneous subfascial or superfascial uh, tumor. Uh, and here again, you can see these uh, nice arching vessels in some of these areas around these uh, slightly lobular uh, pattern uh, tumor cells. So as I mentioned, I'm not gonna talk about the uh, myogenic sarcomas, that would be a somewhat different topic, but uh, these do have uh, some immunohistochemical demonstration of myo myogenic uh, features. So either Desmond, myogenin, myoD1, something of that sort of thing. Uh, in the adults with this lesion, cytogenetics does not help you, but in the pediatric population, that can be uh, very useful. Um, and in this situation, we're, we're concerned about carcinomas, melanoma, or uh, one of these other uh, high-grade tumors that has myogenic features or heterologous elements as a uh, con differential consideration. So dedifferentiated liposarcoma, the other big uh, fish in the room, this is usually older adults, retroperitoneal location. And in fact, most of these uh, dedifferentiated tumors are de novo, uh, whereas uh, only 10% are uh, rising from known well-differentiated liposarcoma. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a low-grade component when it presents uh, and we diagnose dedifferentiated liposarcoma, uh, but uh, it's uh, gone undetected as a well-differentiated liposarcoma for a sufficient length of time that has had the opportunity to dedifferentiate. Uh, so we'll look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, it's also important to remember that uh, this is a tumor that can have both high-grade and low-grade dedifferentiation. Uh, so this is a relatively lower-grade dedifferentiation. This is not a, a markedly pleomorphic, but you can see how these vessels uh, branching this might raise that possibility of, um, you know, a uh, myxofibrosarcoma or something of that sort uh, that uh, we've just uh, looked at. Uh, again, with this lesion, you want to look at the periphery and see if you can identify uh, more characteristic uh, uh, well-differentiated liposarcoma. This doesn't look like we have that in this slide, uh, but that will also be a clue. Uh, the other feature that is quite useful, of course, is uh, being able to identify the uh, characteristic MDM2 mutations either by immunohistochemistry or fish testing. Um, and these also tend to have uh, CDK4 uh, expression uh, as well as uh, P16 in most cases. And here's an example with a sort of infiltrative pattern into the fat, a little higher grade, uh, more pleomorphic tumor, uh, uh, as you can see here. And if you oftentimes, if you go out into the fat here, uh, you'll find the features of 
uh, low-grade or well-differentiated liposarcoma, the pleomorphic cells in the fibrous septi associated with this uh, uh, fatty proliferation uh, of the lesion. Another example, uh, fat in the background. Oops, this is a, this is not the, uh, there's the tumor here. No. Well, I guess we got a bit of a, a kidney biopsy associated with a case that had that, and this is not going to give us that. All right, so last uh, thing we want to cover is extraskeletal osteosarcoma. Uh, this tends to be older adults, that, uh, and this is a lesion that arises without an associated uh, connection to identifiable bone. Uh, there's no other lines of differentiation, and so uh, we've excluded those tumors that can have heterologous elements like malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors or trident tumors um, and so forth. Um, this, uh, again, is uh, more frequent in males, uh, present in the uh, proximal extremities or around the shoulder or hip, uh, and uh, almost exclusively is deep soft tissue. Uh, interestingly, it's not uncommon for these patients to have a history of trauma to the region and to suspect that this is a post-traumatic related cases. Um, but in contrast to myositis pacificans, which you might think of related to trauma, these do not have the uh, um, polarity and, and organization of uh, those lesions. They tend to, the differentiation, the uh, those features tend to be uh, reverse of what you see in myositis pacificans. Uh, now, occasionally you will have cases that have uh, MDM2 or CDK4 positivity raising consideration of, uh, oops, I, just, I guess you missed the, I missed the digital slide here, uh, that will, di will sometimes have that uh, positivity making consideration of um, a dedifferentiated liposarcoma possibility um, to uh, consider. But if you have osteoid, that is not a feature you should see in a dedifferentiated like liposarcoma. So to summarize these uh, lesions, uh, think clearly, know the, the clinical pathologic patterns, consider the location, superficial, deep, proximal extremities, intra-abdominal, et cetera, et cetera. Use immunohistochemistry carefully to exclude things that could get you in trouble. Um, and uh, don't rely overly on molecular genetics because those have relatively limited value with these uh, pleomorphic uh, malignant uh, tumors. So that brings us to the end of our discussion. Thank you very much, and I will look forward to uh, uh, your questions or comments. Uh, feel free to add those. And uh, until next time, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for joining me.